Hello and welcome to this Serial Geek TV episode commentary for Beauty and the Bog Beast, an episode of Dungeons and Dragons produced by Marvel Productions. This introduction sequence was storyboarded by Bob Klein. Bob Klein, a name you will hear over and over again on this channel. He was the storyboard artist that crafted the transformation sequence of Prince Adam into He-Man. He worked on numerous shows throughout the late 70s, 80s, 90s, noughties and I think he only retired a few years back. I found over the years that many artists who've worked in the animation industry also love owning pieces of Bob Klein artwork. He is an artist who is admired by many of his peers. I met the guy once, very very nice guy. I've spoke to him online a couple of times but just some of these artists, all this talent and they're just incredibly sweet people. So yeah, the animation on this series was provided by Toei Doga, who I've mentioned numerous times on this channel, were one of Marvel Productions' go-to Japanese animation studios in the 1980s, and this introduction sequence and every episode is credited to them. And Toei Doga were one of the most prominent Japanese studios in the 1980s, not only working on stuff for Japan, but also for America with Dungeons and Dragons, Marvel Productions in general. So the volume of work they had to do was astonishing, hence why they would outsource themselves to other Japanese studios, which is why sometimes the quality varies. And within each Japanese studio, you'd get different animation teams varying in quality. But I would say for the most part, Dungeons and Dragons has consistently good animation throughout. Good to great. So my history with this show was rather interesting. In the 1980s we had two channels in the UK, so you either watch Children's BBC on a weekday afternoon or Children's ITV on a weekday afternoon. Children's ITV had shows like The Incredible Hulk and He-Man and She-Ra, Inspector Gadget, etc. BBC had Dungeons and Dragons, Thundercats, Battle of the Planets, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But for the most part, I was always a children's ITV child. I think that was born out of my love of the Incredible Hulk cartoon at the time and the He-Man show and subsequently She-Ra. So there was always something to watch on children's ITV. Children's BBC, not always as much. So like most cartoons of the 80s in the UK, Dungeons and Dragons aired once a week. The, the first episode of this series aired in the UK on September the 10th, 1984. And do you know why I wasn't watching this show? Because He-Man was airing at the same time. In fact, when the first episode of Dungeons and Dragons aired, I was actually watching the season one He-Man episode, or Deal in the Darklands, on ITV. So yeah, I missed out on Dungeons and Dragons the first time round. And when this particular episode, Beauty and the Bog Beast aired, I was watching the He-Man episode, The Cosmic Comet. So <laughs> I really did miss out. Although I was getting my fix of He-Man, of course. It's crazy to think that Dungeons and Dragons was up against the most popular cartoon at the time in He-Man, but it may have been very tactical in a way and somewhat shrewd on the part of the BBC, airing a fantasy show in Dungeons and Dragons against another fantasy show in He-Man. And when the Dungeons and Dragons show took a hiatus and resumed in 1985, it was up against He-Man once again. Here's a silly little fact. On the 20th of May 1985, and for the Mondays that followed, Dungeons and Dragons was no longer up against He-Man, who was on a break. The show was up against The Incredible Hulk, a show also produced by Marvel Productions. So it was Marvel Productions versus Marvel Productions on two opposing channels. This next sequence is 100% animated by a different team of animators, and it makes sense. Often teams would be assigned specific scenes to create or visual continuity, but here the animation is really fluid and dynamic as the kids encounter a giant iron golem who towers high above them. The angle of this shot, that's awesome. Oh, pay close attention to the music here, I'll let it play. Bob is Barbarian, and who are you? If this piece of music sounds familiar, it's because the great Johnny Douglas composed this for the Hulk cartoon in 1982, and Marvel Productions reused it here, rather wonderfully if I do say so myself. The Hulk music pops up a few times on this series, and it works really well. I love Bobby's line here. Yes, it does state the show, referencing the baseball player Steve Garvey there, and of course it would be an LA Dodgers player given that the writers for this show and Marvel Productions itself was located in Los Angeles. I actually went to an LA Dodgers game back in 2012. I've got the script for this episode. Originally, Hank's energy arrow didn't see Bobby and Uni leap onto it. The energy arrow created a shield around them, so when the giant golem went to crush them, his hand bounced back and hit him in the face, which is why Sheila says the line, I think he got him mad. 
And now we're going to get another piece of music from the Hulk cartoon. Two pieces of Hulk music in one episode. There's a great angle coming up here of Sheila taunting the giant. And it's funny, we see Sheila show up a fair distance from where she was. In the series Bible, it was stated that Sheila's cloak also allowed her to teleport. But looking at the script, that is not the case here. Sheila's just really, really fast. In the script for this episode, when the Iron Golem is described, it makes mention of the monster manual, specifically page 48. I'm guessing that's a Dungeons & Dragons game-playing manual of sorts. It's funny, quite a few of the writers that I've met over the years that worked in the animation industry all seem to be big gamers, as in they love their Dungeons & Dragons game. It's, um, yeah, really, really fascinating. And here we are with the other gang. I love the way Eric just casually pushes over Presto in a few moments. It's such a cute little scene. Definitely called for in the storyboard, but yeah, it's just a nice little character beat. You think this is a beauty? You should see my mom's garden back home. This is nothing. I realise this is a comedy based episode, but I genuinely find it funny. I always have done, always will. When Eric becomes the bog beast, I think it's Eric's normal voice coming out of a crazy eyed giant bog beast head. It just tickles me, that giant face he has. And it has to be Eric, of course. This gag could work on no other character. And like so many Dungeons and Dragons episodes, even though this is a gag, the payoff throughout the episode, and especially at the end, is so fantastic and almost heartwarming to a degree. It was quite rare for the writers to actually split the gang up so dramatically in a story. But here, it works wonders as we get to see some really interesting dynamics. We have Hank and Sheila, who kind of have a thing for one another, Sheila's younger brother Bobby, and of course Uni. And then on the other tee we have Diana, clearly the leader, Eric, the complainer, and Presto, who has all this great power but doesn't know how to use it, which is another wonderful trait of this series. Goodness, for those that don't know, I'm such a fan of Eric, especially Donnie Most, the voice actor, he of Happy Days. There was something very real about his voice. It, Donnie Most was just talking normally, but somehow it worked perfectly for Eric as the rich, spoiled kid. Talking about the voice actors on this show, specifically the youngsters, they were just fantastic actors. And obviously most of them had come from a career in acting at a very young age. Willie Ames as Hank the Ranger brought a young maturity to the role. He was always very confident in the way he spoke and in those moments he would yell, you could still feel that youthfulness in him. I mean, he was in his early 20s, it's crazy. Don Most, he was actually around about 29, 30, coming off the back of Happy Days when he worked on this show. It's crazy to think that, but even though he was much older than the character he was portraying, he still had a wonderful youthfulness to his voice and it was capable of uttering comedy gold, like throughout this particular episode. Tonya Gale Smith as Diana, she barely did much outside of this show and it's a crying shame because like much of this cast, her voice is so natural and she can act. See the episode Child of the Stargazer for a truly beautiful performance. And she could clearly sing too. If I remember rightly, she's singing at the start of the episode. It's been a while since I watched it. Sadly, since playing the role of Diana on Dungeons and Dragons, there's very little known about her. Adam Richards Presto, his voice always sounded like he smoked about 60 a day, but it was a great voice for a young character. He was about 15 when he performed this role, so maybe his voice was in the transition of breaking. That said, would a voice really break for two years? Thinking about it, even though Bobby's voice is perfect, I could have seen Adam Rich voicing Bobby in this show. It's just the right level of angry child. Katie Lee as Sheila, thankfully that always youthful voice, she still sounds like that has appeared in many cartoons and I always thought her portrayal of Sheila was perfect. Just the right amount of timidness without being considered pathetic or cowardly. When I worked on the Dungeons and Dragons DVD box set, she actually reprised her role as Sheila as a new group of voice actors performed a radio play of Michael Reeves' rather beautiful finale for the series, the unproduced Requiem script. Ted Field III, I was never able to find out his age, but obviously he was the youngest of the actors. And if you've ever seen that awesome cast photo, I'm guessing he's probably around 10, 12 years old in that. Again, singling out an episode with a fine performance, check out The Girl Who Dreamed Tomorrow. Ted Field III may have been young, but my goodness, in this series, and specifically that episode, he could act. You'd have to have a literal heart of stone not to shed a tear at his emotional outpouring in that particular story. My goodness, what did the writers put these kids through emotionally with these scripts? Of course, I'll talk about Frank Welker, Peter Cullen and Sidney Miller in another episode commentary. That goes without saying. There are some shows from the 80s, 90s, heck, even to the modern day that have child actors that really aren't very good. The kids on this show were able to deliver great performances and it probably helped that they had great dialogue to work from too. And yeah, here we get some more Hulk music. Never let me 
Toei Doga here, showing that not only can they animate characters and special effects rather impressively, but also things like sand. Hank betrayed by his bow, or was he? Everything in Dungeons and Dragons happens for a reason, that's part of the beauty of the show. Nothing is by accident, even their existence in the realm, and we assume their eventual departure from the realm. Oh, the Bog Beast reveal is so good here. The children surrounded by the Bog Beast as more Hulk music ends Act 1. The opening staging of this act is rather wonderful, immediately showing us the predicament that our heroes are in, surrounded by what we would come to know as the Bog Beasts. And as for the Bog Beasts themselves, I'm not sure what it is. Something about them I oddly really like. I understand they're played for laughs. But there's something wonderfully endearing about them. Not cute, endearing. <laughs> it may have something to do with their very low level of intelligence, low level of bravery, low level of looks. One of the bizarre things I like about this race of misfits is that in group shots there's a weird uniqueness to each of them. Not sure if it's their individual poses, the randomness of their weapons. Also be sure to look for the one group shot where we see the female bog beast. She's quite the looker. Toei Doga always put in a little extra detail. Don't get me wrong, the storyboard artists at Marvel Productions were ridiculously talented and will put so much into their boards, but it was nice for a Japanese animation studio to enjoy the work they were doing and include those extra pieces of visual flair. So I mentioned earlier that I didn't see Dungeons & Dragons first time around. I was too busy watching the other channel with He-Man on. <laughs> well, in 1987, Dungeons & Dragons was repeated on a show that aired on Saturdays called Saturday Superstore, a very original title. That is where I first remember properly watching the show and really, really enjoying it. I was already aware of the show, but I never went out of my way to watch it. Oddly, after it was shown on Saturday Superstore in 1987, it didn't air on TV in 88 or 89, almost had like a two year hiatus. Then I remember being at secondary school, around about 1990, my friends and I were about 13, 14 years old and we would all watch Dungeons and Dragons after school once a week, then come in the following day and talk about it. Who's your leader? The whole premise of the Bog Beast believing their leader will come from the sky only for Eric to drop out of the sky is great. I do love how so many stories within this show are reliant on establishing a great mythology, even down to the, the myths of specific races in the show and how they connect with the children in many ways, as does the realm itself. So I mentioned before that I have the script for this episode, and even though it was written by Jeffrey Scott, and a fine job he did too, Hank Sarian rewrote some of the dialogue, as he did with many episodes in the series, he was credited with additional dialogue. What am I saying? What am I seeing? And yeah, some of the funnier pieces of dialogue in this episode are credited to him. Like that previous exchange when Eric as the bog bee said, what am I saying? And Sheila replied, what am I seeing? That was a note in red pencil added by Hank to the script. The show is just a wonderful thing for a writer to approach. You're not just writing about the adventures of some children in a fantasy realm. You're able, as we see in this episode, to show how the children's presence affects the lives and futures of many different races, species, groups within the realm. Their presence serves many purposes. It's multifaceted. There we go. <laughs> this, this exchange always kills me when... <laughs> Normal? You normal now! Oh, brother. Brother. Uh, brother. <laughs> I just thought I'd take a little snippet from the Dungeons and Dragons development bible for those of you that have never read it. So it describes Eric like so. Everyone knows an Eric, the kid who, no matter what you're doing, it isn't good enough for him. Knows in the stratosphere, Eric goes through life as snobby as they come. He comes from a family of wealth and breeding and, in the past, has never had to do much of anything himself. He occasionally likes to associate with the poorer folks, if only because it makes him feel like a bigger man. And that's what he was doing with them at the amusement park that fateful day. Actually, if you want to hear more from the Development Bible, let me know. Maybe I could turn it into a series of videos of some sort. An interesting scene removed here. Hank asks Sheila if she remembers what to do. 
In the original script, Jeffrey Scott had Sheila feign that she had forgotten. Would you believe me if I told you I forgot? With Hank simply shaking his head, no, in response. Sheila then turning invisible and accidentally knocking over uni in the process. It was a really quite bizarre scene. You can understand why it was removed for time. <laughs> the the idea of Eric leading a bog beast army is brilliant as well, because bless the bog beasts, they're all rather useless. <laughs> And it always makes me laugh the little asides like when Hank says, your friends. It's like, they're not my friends. <laughs> in a rather grim twist, the original idea here wasn't simply that Calamung had a spare medallion in his possession, but his head was to turn around, revealing another face on the back of his head, wearing the real medallion. It would have made for an interesting, if not highly disturbing image in the show and given kids more nightmares about this series. What am I doing? Sorry, I'm just laughing, watching Eric leading the bog beast towards Calamon. And just getting immediately frozen in their tracks. Yeah, the only unfortunate thing with this episode is it would have been nice to have Kawamung at the beginning of the episode so we see him enslaving these people or just being the dominant force that he is rather than suddenly popping up and us knowing little to nothing about him. Here we see Bobby knocking down a tree and we're about to see something very cool. There, I love those moments of bravery that Eric would unexpectedly show. See, people often question why Eric had the shield. My take on it was that Eric was a coward so he could hide behind the shield However, the shield could also be used to protect others, as we see here, and, and in other episodes. There's a great sight gag coming up here. Eric leads the bog beasts into action, or pushes them into action. Eric questioning why they're running away, only to cut to it. Like, that's a great edit, seeing him run away. <laughs> Wait for me! And yeah, as I've mentioned a couple of times now in the episode, everything happens for a reason, so presto... Magic's up a frisbee thinks it's useless, throws it away, discards it, and what happens? It saves the day. I almost wish, there's a part of me that wishes he didn't realise that he had done that, so it was kind of, it just happened. Wow, did I do that? Yeah, speaking about Presto for a moment, if you've ever seen some of the earlier promotional material for Dungeons & Dragons, you'll see Presto wearing a red wizard's robe. That's a bit of a tongue twister. The first time I ever saw the image was in a trade ad in a Marvel comic for an NBC show called Saturday's Supercade. In the image we see Richard Pryor presenting a bunch of then new cartoons based on some hugely popular video games of the time. There were a couple of other promotional images that were featured in a rather wonderful Marvel Productions article from a magazine the name of which I'm forgetting as I say this. And those images showing the kids fighting Venger also have Presto in red. It was an interesting look but his green was a far better choice. Also, what a great reveal is that, that Kawamung was just another bog beast. <laughs> and, the, and the shot that follows with all the dwarves chasing him. Get him! Diana's hair there is epic. I love that. I almost feel like the bog beast should have been chasing him as well, but obviously they need to be around for the final scene. I always love these moments where the kids would nearly escape the realm, or in this case, drumroll, actually escape the realm. Also, it's interesting to see in this scene that Uni is taken with them because on many occasions the group knew that Uni would not be allowed to travel back with them. And in the script it states that Uni looks at her new surroundings in amazement. I love this scene so much. Normally the gang have to go back for a reason, such as bringing Venger back with them or leaving something behind in the realm that, at that moment, they're not prepared to let go. But here, it's their friendship that prevents them from remaining on Earth. The genius of this episode is that it's not simply Hank or Sheila or Diana, for example, that the kids have to sacrifice their happiness for, but Eric, the least popular member of the group by his own doing. The moment here, Eric pauses knowing that he has to re-enter the realm and this beautiful moment of pause from the gang as they question what to do. Well, what do we do? It's not because they don't want to save Eric, but it's what they're about to sacrifice. It's wonderful writing. And the music, wow, just sets the mood and Eric is all alone. But don't worry Eric, he's got his bog beast friends around which clearly pleases Eric. We couldn't just leave you here all alone. Oh, how beautiful is this? Eric's friends are with him in the realm together, he won't be alone. And that's the thing, for all Eric's complaints, he and all these characters, they all cared for one another, the children, they really did. Eric's happiness here and his dance is wonderful, as is his shock. Ah, dungeon Master. Ah, and yes, dance with Dungeon Master. That is amazing. The little, the little Dungeon Master dance. Yes, please, more of that. 
I think more than most shows of the 80s, Dungeons and Dragons had the happiest endings of any animated series, which is bizarre because it was such a dark show at times with seemingly no hope for these children to ever escape this realm. But these endings kind of gave you a belief, gave you hope that these characters would eventually get home, even though we never saw them get home. It wasn't like a modern TV show that didn't have an ending. In our heart of hearts, we knew that these characters would get home, and I think that's the beauty of the writing of this show. It always gave us hope. And that, that hope kind of puts a smile in your heart. Yeah, that sounds soppy, I'm sure, but to be cynical about an ending like this, boo to you. And this ending theme, simply beautiful. Johnny Douglas, whom I've mentioned on a few commentaries now, creates a wonderful piece of music. Wow so fitting with the message of hope that I just talked about. And yeah, fantastic series and I look forward to talking more about it with all of you. Uh, and that's the end of this commentary. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next one.